Today we're going to talk about periodic trends. These are observed trends for two properties, ionization energy and size of atoms. Before we do that, we want to bring a new term that's extremely important to understanding this. That is effective nuclear charge. Effective nuclear charge is the actual pull on the electron. Hopefully you realize the proton in the nucleus is positive, the electron is negative, and the electron is pulled by that proton in the nucleus. So how we express that is with this formula. Z effective, which is if actual pull on the electron, is equal to Z. Z is a number of protons. Minus S, S is a number of shielding or core electrons. So Z is the atomic number, the number of protons, and S is a number of core or shielding electrons. So how does this work? So if you look at something like sodium, Sodium has 11 protons, but it has 10, 10 shielding electrons. So the effective nuclear charge on sodium, on the electron in sodium, is plus 1. Let's do some more examples. Effective nuclear charge, once again, here's the formula. Z effective, the, the charge the electron actually feels, is equal to the number of protons minus the shielding or number of core electrons. So to help understand this, understand this formula, one thing we might want to do is look at the electron configuration. We'll start with sodium. Sodium is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. The shielding or core electrons, that the, that's the s, for sodium is would be all these electrons right here. So when we subtracted the 10, so when we subtracted the 10, that's where it came from. The 2 plus the 2 plus the 6 gave us the 10 shielding electrons. Now the 11 is basically the atomic number, which is a number of protons in sodium. So we said 11 minus 10 gave us plus 1. So we know sodium has an effective nuclear charge of plus 1. Now let's imagine we're going to do that for magnesium. The only thing different about magnesium is instead of 3s1, magnesium is 3s2. Instead of 12, 11 protons, magnesium has 12. But the number of core or inner electrons does not change. Magnesium, in fact, every single element in this row or period has exactly the same number of core electrons. It's 10. So magnesium would be 12 minus 10. So magnesium would have effective nuclear charge of positive 2. If we take that over to aluminum, Aluminum would be 13 minus 10. So aluminum, aluminum would have an effective nuclear charge of plus 3. Then we take that over to silicon. Silicon would be 14 minus 10. That would be positive 4. And then if we take that over to nitrogen, or I'm sorry, uh, phosphorus, that was silicon. Next would be phosphorus. I'm sorry. Phosphorus would be positive 5. And then next would be sulfur. Sulfur would be a positive 6. Chlorine would be positive 7. And then finally, argon would be positive 8. So if we go across every element in that row or that period, sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, argon, the effective nuclear charge increases as we go across. What does that mean? That means that outer electron feels a greater and greater pull as you go to the right. That's going to help explain two very important properties that we're going to talk about today. First, let's do figure out an effective nuclear charge for a random atom. Let's pick phosphorus. So what you need to do is look at your periodic table and find the atomic number, which is the number of protons on phosphorus. So we do that. Phosphorus is atomic number 15. Then we need to look at the number of core or shielding electrons. Now we know from phosphorus the previous noble gas would be neon, which has 10 valence electrons. So we would subtract 10 from the total number of protons, because so it has 10 shielding electrons and 15 protons. So the effective nuclear charge would be 15 minus 10, or to be positive 5. Now we're going to be able to use effective nuclear charge to help explain a couple of properties we're going to talk about. First, let's talk about the first property, atomic radius. Atomic radius gives us an idea of size. Now, how do they determine atomic radius? 
Anytime two atoms are put next to each other, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if they're bonded or if they're two atoms that aren't bonded, just whenever they're right next to each other, what they look at is a distance between those. So they look at the center of one atom to the center of the other, and, which is a diameter, and they divide that by two, and that would be the radius. Now, the reason that this is done is because the ending of an atom is sort of ambiguous because it's an electron cloud and they can change. And so we look at two atoms next to each other to find the idea with atomic radius, which is size. So here we have our first periodic property we're going to look at. And these drawings give us a, a, a visual visualization of how size changes. First, I think we notice rather dramatically as you go down a column in the periodic table, atoms get bigger. For example, hydrogen, which is 1s, is smaller than lithium, which is 2s. Now, why is that? Well, every time you add an energy level, when you go from 1s to 2s to 3s to 4s, that new level, that new energy level is actually outside the previous one. So every time there's a new energy level, the atom gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And notice when I say the atom gets bigger, it's the electron cloud. Remember, the nucleus is still very small and very dense. So atoms get bigger as you go down the periodic table, the column, because there's a greater and greater number of atomic orbitals. And so that makes a lot of sense. Now the other thing we want to look at is what happens in a period or a row. Now the one we've been focusing on is a row of sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, and argon. Now notice these get smaller as you go to the right. Now the reason they do is that idea of effective nuclear charge. Even though we're adding electrons as we go to the right, those electrons aren't what we call shielding electrons. But the protons, and so because of that, the protons are able to pull in, the electrons are there, plus the additional electrons, even closer, and the atom gets smaller and smaller as you go to, to the right, because there is an increase in effective nuclear charge. If we were to look at the, the trend for size, size gets bigger as you go to the left on the periodic table, and as you go down, it gets bigger as you go to the left, because the effective nuclear charge decreases, and it gets, it gets bigger as you go down a column because you're adding more and more orbitals. So that's our first trend, atomic size. The other thing we're going to look at, uh, so let's look, do a quick question here. As we proceed across the row of the periodic table, atomic weight increases, but atomic radius decreases. Are these trends a contradiction? Absolutely not. Weight tells us, well, the weight of the atom comes from the nucleus. So as you go to the right, you're making that nucleus bigger and heavier. I should say you're making the nucleus heavier, not bigger. You're adding electrons that aren't shielding, and so that nucleus with more protons is able to pull that electron cloud in closer and closer together. So as you go to the right, due to the effect of nuclear charge, atoms get smaller and smaller in a row in the periodic table. Next, size of ions. Now first we see generally here, the same trend we saw previously, that ion size gets bigger as you go down, and within either an anion or cation, within either an anion or cation, size gets smaller between the cations and smaller among the anions as you go to the right. So let's look at some reasons. So atomic size depends on three factors. The first is nuclear charge, which I would call effective nuclear charge. Now, effective nuclear charge really depends on those valence electrons being pulled in closely. So if you compare ions, like the lithium lithide ion and the beryllium ion and the boron ion, notice they get smaller as you go to the right. The reason they're getting smaller as you go to the right is nuclear charge, specifically effective nuclear charge. Now notice we're going to compare those anions and those cations separately. Now let's look at those anions. If you look at oxide versus fluoride, notice fluoride is smaller. The reason it gets smaller as you go to the right is we're increasing effective nuclear charge. You added a greater number of protons. Even though, those, even though the number of electrons in oxide and fluoride would be exactly the same, the increased number of protons make the atomic size, which is an electron cloud, a little bit smaller. So that's nuclear charge. The next factor is number of electrons. So we said this has to do with a, the first nuclear charge has to do with a period. 
So I'll see if I can write that in a period. Or a row. That might have been easier to write. Now, the number of electrons has to do with anions. A-N-I-O-N-S. Remember, anions are negative. If we look at any anion here, let's take our bromide one. Now, notice... If there are, more elect there are more electrons in the bromide ion than in the bromine atom. With more electrons, there is an increased repulsion, so the bromide ion with one more electron is bigger than the bromine atom with one fewer electron. And so uh, anions, the one with a greater number of electron is always number of electrons is always larger. Last, the orbitals in which electrons reside. So let's look at an example. Let's say we look over here at sodium. Now we see we've got sodium and sodium ion, which the sodium ion is, is you can see, quite a bit smaller than the sodium atom. Now why is there such a big difference in size? Well, it has to do with orbital in which electrons res reside. If you look at sodium, it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. But the sodium ion is only 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. The fact that sodium that is neutral has an extra 3s1, remember that 3s is further away from the nucleus, and so that means it's a larger atom. Orbitals, orbitals in which it resides. So this has to do with cations. So cations are, are always bigger when they're neutral because they have an extra orbital. And this also has to do for a family. So if you look at a family on the periodic table, we'll do that in a second. I'm going to write the word family out here. So if you look at a family on the periodic table, let's say we, we look at the one with oxygen, oxide, sulfide, selenide, telluride, notice they, the family gets bigger and bigger as you go down in, in the column. The reason they get the size gets bigger when you go down the column is you're adding orbitals which are further and further away. So a quick review, nuclear charge makes atoms smaller in a period, whether they're cations or anions, as you go to the right. Number of electrons have to do with only anions when you're comparing the neutral atom versus the negative anion. The anion is going to be bigger. And then finally, orbitals in which they reside. The cation, the one that's charged, is always going to be smaller because it has one fewer electron because that extra electron is in an orbital further away. This also applies to families. So last, we're going to look at Let's say which is larger, sodium ion or sodium. Remember, sodium is plus one, so, uh, and then sodium neutral. So what we do is we look at the orbitals in which electrons reside. We know sodium is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1, but the sodium ion is lost at 3s1. The fact that there is a 3s1 in neutral sodium means this is going to be a, a larger atom.